Welcome back to Auto Technic, and I can't tell you guys how excited I am for today's video. This is something I've been waiting for for a very long time, and well, that's because we're going to be diving into some Ferrari content finally, and there is not a better car to start with than this 1999 F 355. So this 355 came to me because it is due for its major service or its engine out that is essentially a timing belt replacement. So this car does run two timing belts. Ferrari specifies that they need to be replaced every three years, no matter the mileage. This car is well past due that. A lot of clients do stretch that out, but it is a huge job. It's a major job. So if, generally, if I'm working on this uninterrupted for eight hours a day, it's going to be at least five days of work. And that's not counting if I find any other items that need attention while I'm there because we have so much work ahead of us and I want to provide it to you in a very detailed manner. We're going to break all these videos up into a segments and series and today we're going to be focusing on the inspection and really the readiness of the car before we actually get into the service work. Now on a car of this value we really want to be sure that I have it documented and known the condition of the car when it's presented to me from the client. I want to be sure that I can give it back in the same way I received it. On top of that, we need to be sure that we know the health of the engine. We also need to get underneath the car, get a good assessment of the mechanicals and relay that information to the customer. The reality is a lot of these cars sit and they don't see a lot of driving, but the way I like the service to maintain them is that at any minute they could be taken out on a track and ex exercised to their full potential. So that means in this particular car, at any minute, I need to make sure that it's safe and ready to run at extended times at high speeds, 180, 190 miles an hour. Now, is this client and most clients gonna do that? Not likely, but there are clients that do do that. A lot of these cars do see track time. So it is really my duty as someone who's servicing the car and looking over it and the caretaker of it to ensure the client that their car is ready to go and ready to be used however they would like. So I'll give you guys a better look at what we're working with here. And cosmetically, this car is in great shape. This particular car has about 48,000 miles and it show, it does not show it on the outside. It has been very well maintained and cared for. Really no damage to the body, no dents, no rash. This owner definitely takes care of it. And it is just a absolutely gorgeous example. Now this car happens to be a GTS. So it has a removable target top, which is a very cool feature and one that I am a big fan of. Now this car also happens to be a F1 car, as you can see back there, designating the transmission on this. So it is a true manual transmission, although it has a hydraulic actuator that's controlling the clutch and the shifting of the gears. And to shift the gears from inside the car, you just have paddles on the steering wheel. Now the F1 system did debut on the 355s and it is technology that Ferrari pulled from the F1 program. It is definitely a very cool system, very neat and they really started to refine it throughout the years so on the 360s and the later 430s the system got incredibly good um, almost to the point on the later cars at the f1 systems i actually prefer them over a normal stick and clutch setup believe it or not and i'm a big stick guy but say like on a 430 scuderia the system is so good that i would probably take that over a clutch and a stick so enough about the F1, you can tell the outside of the car, it's in great shape and it, that's all cosmetic stuff. So we're not really gonna worry about that as we go and pop you in on the interior. This car is actually optioned with a factory carbon fiber package on the door panels and interior. Incredibly rare, incredibly rare. Truth be told, I worked in the dealership for about 10 years. This is the first one I've seen with that package. That's how rare that is. I have seen one other 355 with the carbon fiber seats, but I only saw that one car one time. So some of these cars have some options that are really incredibly rare. The carbon fiber on this one is that right there. So it has it here on the door panel inserts. We have it on the rocker seals. Our center console has it. And what Ferrari calls the binnacle, which is the trim around the gauges for the instrument cluster, that is all carbon fiber. And side note, I've always got a big laugh that they call that the binnacle. Um, always pretty humorous anytime you get to throw that word around, just one of the quirks of the brand, I guess. So anyways, as we can see on the inside of this car, it's again, just like the outside, incredibly well kept. The leather is in great shape. You know, it shows a little bit of wear for the mileage, but nothing too big and nothing too much to worry about. Now we do have some leather um, shrinkage and bubbling on the airbag here incredibly common almost all the cars do that of the era so that again just cosmetic doesn't affect the operation of anything and 
honestly, he's not too bad because the rest of his dash is good. It's only isolated to the airbag on his car. Usually, the binnacle is the, the key um, culprit for that, but he doesn't have to worry about that. So, really not a whole lot to note in here, um, visually and cosmetically. And obviously, this client knows the condition of his car. He drives it. He cleans it, he maintains it, and cares for it. So he's going to be aware of all that stuff, and we don't need to go into great detail documenting that here. The next step that we need to take in order to really evaluate this car is get it out on the road and give it a good road test. Now, rather than just jumping in the car, taking off and driving, there's a few things I'm going to check. One of the main and most critical, in my opinion, is checking the dot dates and the tires. So right here on our dot date, it is 2014. So that is the 20th week of 2014. These tires are 10 years old to today's date. Now I can reach in here and feel the tread that they're virtually full tread in a brand new tire, but I'm using my hand and actually squeezing it. So I have my palm here on the sidewall of the tire and I'm trying to pull the tread blocks towards me. I'm feeling how stiff those are. What happens because these cars don't get driven, the tires don't get worn out. But what a lot of people don't realize is all the solvents in the rubber of the tires, it will evaporate over time and these tires will start to get very, very hard and well, that's good to know when we're driving the car because I need to know how much available grip I have because some of these cars say if it had the original tires, which is not that uncommon to get a car this old with the original tires, you have to be very, very careful when you're driving them because, well, you don't have the grip that you think you would have. So our rear tire back here is 3813, so this tire is even older, and I can tell that these these tread blocks are actually pretty stiff and pretty firm as opposed to the front. The front weren't too bad, these back ones are pretty bad. Now, a good general rule of thumb is you wanna replace your tires when they get about six years old. There is some lead way depending on how the car is stored and if it's heated or not heated and then really your environment. Ultimately, the factor that I use to decide the condition of the tire is really how soft the rubber is. Now, when we get it in the air, we're gonna check and make sure there's no dry rotting or no cracking, but I do know that this car is on older tires. So we're just gonna give it a little extra ounce of caution when we're driving it. Um, because we're not, like I mentioned, we're not going to have the grip that we would with brand new tires. Although we're not going to be driving this car out to really be, you know, exceeding or pushing it to its limits. But we do want to be able to drive the car and give it a proper evaluation. The next thing we're going to do a quick check on is our fluids and our lights. Once we give those the A-OK, -okay, it's time to hit the road. So we need the car running and warm in order to get a proper reading on our engine oil level. But before we fire it up and get it hot, I'm gonna take advantage and really the main thing here is check our coolant level. Obviously we don't wanna be checking that when it's very hot. And I just wanna make sure that we have adequate coolant in the overflow reservoir, which we do. It is a hair low. So we will note that and correct that during the service. Now earlier off camera, I did turn the key on or in this car, open the driver's door, which primes the F1 pump. And this is our F1 fluid off here on the left side, which it's not reading on the dipstick, but I can see it right down there in the reservoir. We have plenty of fluid for proper function, although it is a little bit low. So we are correct to that during our service as well. And we'll jump up here to the power steering. And again, it is just a hair low, although we're cold. Not a big deal because we will have to completely drain all of the power steering fluid out of this car in order to do the service. So now that we know that those are good, it is time to go fire the car up and get some heat in that engine oil so that way we can see what level it's at now. So we'll just give this some time to idle and warm up, build some heat, we'll come back, see where our oil level's at. All right, so it's been running for a little bit. We got some heat in the engine. We have some heat in the oil. It's not up the full operating temp, but it's good enough for us to give it a check. And with the engine running, we'll pull out our dipstick. And oh, yep. This car is what I consider to be overfilled with oil. So if you look, we have oil all the way up to the max line on the dipstick. And I set my oil level to the minimum line at full temperature. Now I'll share with you guys why in a little bit, why I do so. And that's one of the common things I see on these cars is the oil level and how it's set. It's a little bit different on these cars with a dry sump versus a car with a wet sump. All right, she's getting warmed up. 
We're at 190 degrees. Throughout the drive, we're gonna to continue to check the operation of all of our controls, our blinkers. Um, horn's working great. So I think we're good. Pop her in gear and we'll head off. operating the same way when we return to the client. So we'll just get on and cruise. Again, we're evaluating our steering wheel. We do have a bit of a vibration in the front, so that would be a bit of a tire balance. Make note of that. Um, I would say the steering wheel is just a hair off to the right. That is a minor thing. Try some different vent positions here. back roads on the way back uh, but one thing to keep in mind is we just wanted to minimize the length of the test drive and also I was really conscious trying to avoid traffic so really want to minimize the risk that we're putting the car out by having it on the road but still need to get a good evaluation of the car a little bit of a compromise but we got a good little route set up and uh, vent temp 47 degrees it's pretty solid enough they're one of my absolute favorite cars they just drive so good the sound the engine makes it's one of the best sounding Ferraris that they ever made they're just such a pleasure to drive and I really 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 love these cars they are genuinely they are on my short list of the best Ferraris at all we had a good firm shift on that power delivery felt normal so this car is driving really nice I don't feel anything abnormal or loose from the suspension there's no clunks the handling feels good the brakes feel nice and firm and we have noticed a few things we have the vibration on the steering wheel uh, we got the blinker issue so we did pick up a couple things here but overall it's a very solid car it seems very well worked out um, honestly, once we get this up in the air and we get the under trays off of it and we start looking at it, I don't really expect to find a whole lot wrong with it. Um, we never know until we get under it though. So.
All right, that was pretty successful and the car drove quite nicely. Um, so before we forget, go through our list and jot down the few things that we noted. Um, right hand blinker, front wheel balance. This car is suffering from the sticky treatment on all the interior switches. I'll grab you guys real quick and show you what I'm talking about. So I left the key on for a bit. My suspension light is back on. That's what I was talking about earlier. That's normal. If that suspension light stays on once you start to drive the car, then you have a suspension error. If you're just leaving the car static with the key on with no movement, that light will come on and it goes away. So don't fret on that. You'll notice our gear indicator because we're an F1 car, it is missing a pixel. And you can actually see some remnants up here of the sticky no more or the sticky soft touch finish. Um, I guess sticky no more is the remedy for that. But these really early Ferraris um, through the 90s and 2000s, Ferrari was really big on this finish. It's like a soft rubberized finish that goes on all the buttons and switches. It's only a matter of time before it's going to degrade. It's, it's just a known fact. Every single car has this problem. Some happen quicker than others. Now this finish is extremely sticky very messy gets on your clothes gets on your hands it's the stuff's absolutely terrible and ferrari really refuses to do anything about it it's a very well-known problem in the ferrari community uh, this car the client and i initially did talk about addressing some of the sticky no more items and he ultimately decided not to go through the refinishing process because of the cost of it which is completely fine and so he chose to clean most of the stuff off himself with some lacquer thinner so like these door poles here and he's gotten most all the switches and the vents and i would say he's probably got 90 percent of it out there's still a few traces of it here and there the stuff is really hard to get out of the car and fully eradicated but again it's just another thing that we're noting on our inspection sheet obviously the customer knows we talked about it but my whole purpose of this inspection is to have everything documented because what if he's to sell the car in a year it's a great document for him to pass on to the new owner and just kind of keep track of the history of the car throughout the years. Okay, as promised, let's circle back and discuss why we set our oil level to the minimal mark. Now, specifically, this only really applies to a car with a dry sump oiling system, such as this car and most all Ferraris. There is a few exceptions to that rule. The reasoning be being on a dry sump oil system, all of our oil is stored in the external tank. It's not in the sump of a pan and all that oil is pulled from the bottom of that tank into the pump to pressurize the engine. Now these oil tanks are designed to be relatively tall and narrow in diameter, and that is to keep a large column of oil above the pickup, which is at the bottom of the tank. Now why I say we're setting the oil level at the minimum is for one, the oil expands a lot as it gets hot and grows. And also since the cross section area of our tank is relatively small, the growth of the oil is much more than you would expect to see in a normal wet sump oiling system. And we don't want it to get too high. The reason why you don't want it to get too high is at the top of the tank there is breather lines that run into the air inlets on the engines and if you set the oil too high the engines will pull oil into the air intake. Now we don't want any oil into the engine obviously but the worst part about this is if that does happen you can actually pull oil across airflow meters essentially ruining them. So at the car and engine oil at operating temperatures set it to the minimum mark and you won't have any troubles and you'll have no worries about ingesting oil into the intake track of the engine. Okay so here's the plan. I think, I, think, I think this will be the plan. The car is racked up, it's ready to go and proceed with the inspections. I need to run through and do all the basic checks. We're talking brake pad thickness, tire tread, document the tire dates, shake down the suspension ball joints. Take a quick glance at the car. So I think I'm gonna run through all those items and hit that list, look around the car, get a general idea of what's going on. At that point, I think I'll bring you guys back and we're gonna go into all of the really specific items in much more detail. So we're gonna be running through some emissions testing, compression testing, doing some other checks in the car, confirming some systems are good. And I'm also gonna show you some really like highlight points that you wanna look for on these 355s, common failure items that we're just gonna proactively check. So set you guys down. I'm gonna run through that real quick, easy stuff. Then we're gonna go through the more detailed checks and inspections on the car. And I think at the very end, I'll bring you guys all the way back. We will look at the list of items that we found on the car, discuss those a little bit more and well, see where that takes us.
All right, here's where we're at. Now that we know we're doing an engine out on this car, so we know we have to take off all these panels. So I'm just gonna do it now and it's gonna make this inspection tremendously easier. We have the wheels off the car finally, and you can see we're at the back. We have all these fender liners here. They just come out with some Phillips head screws and that's gonna open up everything back here. We'll see the radiators, the oil tank, most of the engine gearbox. It really opens up the back of the car and gives us a lot of access. But I also wanted to take advantage and show you guys before I took everything off, is the underside of this 355. So you can see that the 355 is really the first Ferrari where they started incorporating the underbody panels of the car for aerodynamics, where it's channeling the air out through the back and making a low pressure area. Now, all of these panels I need to get off of the car. So essentially starting back here at the rear and then you work your way forward as they overlap and we'll pull them off all the way to the front. Just to get a good look, there's not much to see up there on the front panels, but we're here servicing the car, so we'll take them off and take a good look. And really, the heart of it is we need this mid and these rear panels off so we can get really good access to the engine. That, in conjunction with getting these wheel wheels out, really opens things up. So I'm going to continue on, get all these panels off the car, really get my eyes in here and give it a good look over. As you can see, we got a coolant leak there we need to address, and we have some oil leaks on the gearbox. But finish up this inspection, like I said, and then we're gonna get to the good stuff here in a second, guys. Okay, we have the inner fenders out and the inner trays off, and I'll give you a little peek here. You can see that it is a radical difference. We have a great shot right there of the valve cover, cylinder head, and the exhaust manifolds on this car, which we'll have to pay quite a bit of attention to, and we'll drop you over to this side. Now, we don't have an oil tank to fight with, so we have much more visibility of the engine, and you can see our radiators are right over there. Fuel filters up there, so quite a bit of visibility. We can see everything that we need to. And I'll drop you guys down now that we have the under trays off. And again, we can actually see what's going on with this car. And I have had a chance to look it over. So for all the items that I found on this car that need a little bit extra attention, um, so far, none of them stand out. They're not out of the ordinary. And they're all honestly very typical of 355s. And they're some of the key areas we're going to look at. So I wanted to take you through and go through some of those in more detail. So we'll jump back over here to the passenger side. And we'll see if I can't get my light in here. It's pretty tight. Now, this is one of the very common things, and if you look, we have what I'd call sweating on the cam cover or valve cover gasket to the head, which is very normal. The gasket design on these is not that great. But if we get down in here and you look at this back corner, there is the gasket has pushed out. So it's just a long paper gasket that comes through here, and it is very problematic and a very prone area where that gasket over time with heat cycles of the engine slides out, and then that leaves a void, and that's where we're getting all of our oil seepage and it will eventually cause oil drips right here on the back corner of the cylinder head, which we do have on the other side. And that gasket has pushed out on this other side as well. Bring you guys around. I think we might actually have a better view on this one. Well, there we go. So you can see that we have a lot more oil residue on the cam cover 
And if you can see on that back, that gasket is pushed out as well. Again, very common. Uh, keep an eye for some future videos when I have those cam covers off because I will show you guys some tricks on how to prevent those gaskets from pushing off. Um, one thing I kind of mentioned earlier is exhaust manifolds. We do need to check those. They are very, very prone to cracking on these 355s. So we'll test those a little bit later on. Another thing that you definitely want to keep an eye on is your non-return valves here for your secondary air system. Those fail as well. We'll check those once we have everything apart and it's just essentially a one-way valve and we want to make sure that it's sealing up in the opposite direction. And bring you guys down under the car. And we'll look right back up here in this corner and you can see this little box right here. That box right there and you see that green epoxy potting in it and there's another one that's right above it. Those are what we call the CAT ECUs. So there's a thermal couple that goes into those and they're measuring the exhaust temperature. They control your slow down lights. 355 happens to have three, one for either side. So there's another one on the top side of the engine bay for the left hand side. There's one for the right hand side. Then there's a third one that runs the thermocoupler that's in the catalyst bypass pipe. So those are definitely things to keep an eye out on and look at those. Now there's an older version of these and that poxy um, potting that's in there is actually black. And that's the older version and they're more prone to failure, although these can fail too. So general rule of thumb, black is bad, green is good. B for bad, G for good. So you have the updated ones if you have the green ones in there. Just something to note and it's something that I make a habit of checking on all 355s. Now I'll spin you guys around over here and you can see we have a little bit of seeping from the gearbox. Now one interesting thing to note on a 355 is it has a longitudinal engine and a transverse gearbox. And if you actually notice, the clutch and flywheel are all the way back here at the very back of the engine and the starter is actually on the top of it. So it's a bit of a different setup. Um, don't see that too often, but we have, I mean, sweating. It's not really dripping. It did leave one drip here sitting overnight, so it's not that bad. It's sweating some oil. Uh, on something like this, and give the customer the option, it's most likely one or a combination of these three cover plates right here. So we can give them the option to go and put new gaskets in there. It's not a terribly big deal. You can see that we have a lot of coolant residue over here, and I found a tremendous amount of coolant residue up here on the engine. I did find something at the top side that we need to talk about a little bit more on that. So we're definitely going to have to keep an eye or investigate this a little bit more because that is not normal. That's a lot. And I looked back at the notes when I first spoke to the client about this car, and he was mentioning that he is losing coolant. So we can confirm, yep, he's losing coolant. And we'll get you guys up here, give you a shot. Of, here's our harmonic balancer, and you can see... I can get a finger in between the balancer and the frame of the car. So this is why we're pulling the engine out to do the timing belts. You can just simply see there's no space. Some people will pull the fuel tank, which is right here out, and then they can go up over this brace and get in and work on it, but you're still not able to do the cam covers and the cam timing when you're doing it that way, and that's just not the way I believe it should be done. So we'll be dropping the engine. This whole subframe here comes out. You know will come out with it. Now, we'll spin you guys over here and jump you up there. If you get the camera, you can see right up there, we have a torn open CV boot. Again, very common, very normal for 355s. So just give the customer the option to address that now. I would definitely put that on the high priority list of items. And um, cruise around, try to think if there's anything else I saw under here. Uh, another thing actually I want to talk about cats. Cats fail frequently on 355s and you'll notice because they'll either rattle when the car is at idle and or it'll fail where you have cat faults. But actually since we're doing the timing belt service we'll have the exhaust disconnected right here. The cats are coming out of the car the muffler is going to stay. That's going to let me look straight in the outlet of the cat in the back side and you'll be able to see if the honeycomb is broken and honestly that's the best way to inspect it. I mean we could pull the O2 sensor and boroscope it but since we're gonna have everything off and we can look at it, that is easiest way to go, which we'll do. Um, another thing, flywheel, 355s, dual mass flywheel. So they're packed with grease, so they have springs inside. The grease kind of helps those dampen those springs and that grease breaks down over time, gets thin. It can leak out, there are seals there, they rattle. It doesn't cause a lot of drivability issues. Um, it kind of causes some harshness, I guess, when you can clutch engages and disengages, it's not as smooth but you can hear a big rattle from the back of the car. 
So that is one thing to keep in mind. You can get in there and get those rebuilt. Now, when I was driving this car around, I did not hear any rattling from the flywheel. I didn't hear anything from the cats. It was actually pretty quiet at the back of the car, but that is one very common 355 issue. And we'll shoot you guys up to the front. As I mentioned earlier, there's not a ton to talk about up here with the under trays off, but you can see we have all of our junctions for our heating hoses, power steering hoses, and AC lines. Now I say this because up here on our two heater hoses, you can see where they're leaking and it actually did have some coolant dripping. Hoses are still in good shape. There's really nothing wrong with these particular hoses. I was able to get a little bit of extra turns on these clamps, although they're still pretty tight. I was able to tighten them just a little bit more. Pretty normal. Again, these cars, when you fire them up cold, they build their heat really, really fast. They don't necessarily run hot, but they build heat real fast. So the heat cycles are very extreme on these cars. And all these hose clamps, they just tend to loosen over time and leak. I've never seen it happen on any other cars. I've worked on tons of cars my entire career, but for some reason, Ferrari Maserati brand, um, it is very common. So we tighten those hose clamps up. We'll need to address the coolant leak that's causing the the big leak at the back of the car and then we'll pressure test it and make sure these aren't leaking and they don't need any other attention so again you can see the wheels off we have full view of the suspension um, another 355 specific thing is you want to look at the top of these shocks and make sure there's no leaking oil checked all four they're all good all of our ball joints are good sway bar in links everything up here is good brakes rotors all the wear is good and Nothing that stands out back up there. So while we're back here and under the car, another area to look is the engine and trans mounts. You wanna make sure that they're not starting to sag and dry rot. Uh, this car, there's no problems with them. I would show you guys, but I can't really get the camera in there. We might be able to get a better peek at them once the engine's out of the car. We'll have a much clearer view, but definitely another item that you wanna specifically look out for on a 355. I nearly forgot to show you guys. We got the wheels off the car and the 355 has magnesium wheels. Therefore, it has aluminum inserts with a lug bolt seat into the wheels, and they are very prone to cracking. If we look back here at this rear wheel, see if I can get the camera to show, there's a fine little crack right there. So we can purchase these. There is a company that makes them aftermarket, not Ferrari, and we can drive these out and install new ones. Definitely something to keep an eye out and look for. You want to make sure that those don't crack. I would say that they're more often or not cracked unless they've been replaced. Out of all 20, we only have one that's cracked, but again, something we'll note and see if the customer wants to replace. All right, top side of the engine bay. Now, really, most of the stuff that we inspected we're going to be doing from the wheel wells or the bottom, but there's a few things to kind of note and keep an eye on up here. Uh, just for note, there's the other CAT ECU that I was talking about. And up here, we're looking for the conditions of lines, hoses, making sure everything is good. I mentioned at the beginning that this car did have a check engine light on. The customer was aware of it, and he was told he had issues with his secondary air pump. Well, I noticed right away when he dropped it off that this vacuum hose for this control valve diaphragm right here on the outlet of the secondary air pump into the non-return valves, it is off. So that right there is going to absolutely cause the secondary air system to not work. However, 355s have a lot of common problem areas on the secondary air system. The customer did say that he thought the fuse was blown for the air pump, so I went into the car and checked. Sure enough, the fuse is blown. Now, the fuse for the air pumps blows frequently because the air pumps have a deadhead, meaning either this valve is shut, or the control valve is not working, or there's no vacuum, and it's not allowing the pump to actually move any air or have any flow, and that causes a big load on the pump. It causes them to burn out and blow the fuse. So. The pump could be bad, but we could have other problems. Now there is small one-way check valves that go on either bank of 355s that supply the vacuum reservoir with vacuum. Those commonly fail. You can see I already have brand new ones because they fail so frequently. I just put them in with the service to make sure we're good there. Those are gonna control the supply. We have a big vacuum canister back there and that vacuum canister controls the secondary air pump valve and our exhaust bypass valve. So, I've already replaced the fuse for the secondary air pump. I'm gonna reconnect this hose and I'm gonna throw a vacuum gauge on right at that junction of that hose and I'll also throw another vacuum gauge to a reservoir. That's gonna tell me a couple things. When I fire the car up, I'm gonna make sure that I have vacuum in the vacuum tank and then I can see if this is actually actuating and that valve right there, the control valve is actually opening and I'll 
allowing the second air to flow back into the exhaust. Third, since I put the fuse in, I'm gonna listen and see if the pump runs. If the pump runs, we're gonna let the car run and see if the system operates as it should. If the pump doesn't run, we'll check the fuse, we'll check operation of the pump. So we can do a couple really quick, easy checks while I'm doing other checks on the car without really diagnosing the system, so to speak, and get an idea of how it's operating and if there's anything wrong with it, relay that information back to the customer and see what he wants to do with it. Now, while I was looking around up here on the car, I can shoot you down. It's gonna be hard to see. But on top of the gearbox, I noticed there was a puddle of coolant. And I started looking around up here by the oil filter and you might be able to see right down in those holes. Again, we had coolant sitting there. I already pulled the cover off this top of the engine that covers our coolant take, and that's gonna allow me to just move the coolant tank out of the way. And I found a glaring problem. Set this up so you guys can see. And if we look, that round tube that's underneath that linkage is the heat exchanger for the gearbox. And if you see that rear hose clamp that's all the way at the back, it is nearly completely slid off that. So that cooler, has gearbox oil ran through it, but it's cooled via coolant. So that more than likely is our leak. However, there's still coolant that I could see leaking from the front of the engine, and that's definitely more towards the rear. I'm gonna take a couple minutes, see if I can't loosen that clamp up, get it repositioned. That way that's going to allow me to A, run the car, because I'm a little nervous with that clamp coming off. I don't know how that thing hasn't completely come off and lost all the coolant. But it's gonna allow me to run the car eventually, but primarily it's gonna allow me to get a coolant pressure tester on the cooling system. We can pressurize it and see if there's any other leaks that we need to take care of, like the ones in the front that we talked about. So give me a couple minutes, I'm gonna get that screwed on. We'll get the coolant pressure tester set up and then we need to dive in and inspect our exhaust manifolds. All right, so I got my flashlight holding the coolant reservoir out of the way and we'll just see if we can loosen this clamp up and get it moved forward back onto the hose and tightened and um, allow us to pressurize this cooling system. Now, if you guys have noticed, I've had to prop the engine bonnet open with prop rods. And again, that's another thing that's pretty common that gas struts, they lose their charge over time and are no longer able to hold them open. So a pretty inexpensive, easy repair. But one thing to keep in mind is the temperature will change how well they actually hold up or not. So the hotter it is, the better they will be, and the colder, well, they're not gonna hold up very well and it's gonna wanna fall. So see if we can't get this clamp position. This hose is so swollen. This is gonna be hard. So that rubber boot is so swollen that the hose clamp's not big enough to fit on there. Also, my coolant tank is fighting me. Let's see if we can't find a longer bolt, just for now. All right, so I just grabbed a longer bolt. It needed to be just a skosh longer, and that way I'll be able to hopefully get this clamp back on and secured. This clamp doesn't fit because the silicone boot or the rubber boot has swollen so much. Um, so we will probably have to come in here and replace that. This is just a fix to allow me to run the car and to confirm that I don't have any other leaks. This is by all means not a long lasting permanent repair. So, seems to be getting a hold and we'll get this guy cinched down. All right, there we go. So, Drop you guys in real quick. You can now see our hose clamps all the way on. And also if you look right up there on our thermostat, we have a little bit of coolant seeping there. So I don't think that's the main leak that we're seeing, but it is one thing to note, just a little gasket up there we'll probably have to address. One thing to keep in mind on these cars is pressure testing the cooling system. If you pressure test it when it's warm, you may not have a leak. You pressure test it when it's cold, you might have a leak. So sometimes you'll put a pressure tester on it and the car's warm, no leak, walk away, go to lunch, go home for the night, come back, big leak. 
all pretty normal. So we're testing it cold here and um, just going to run it up to 15 PSI. And once we get it to 15 PSI, shut that off. Isolate our supply and see if our pressure drops and see if we have any visible leaks. Immediately. Instantly. Just puking from right up at the front of the engine. We're just going to have to note that there's really not an easy way to get up there and get our eyes on the water pump. And that was, ironically enough, an item of discussion between the client and I, and we were going to assess it once it's out of the car. So once I have the engine out, I can trace it and see. There's not a lot up there where it could leak. Um, so thinking this car might be getting a water pump rebuilt. All right, so now we need to check the integrity of the headers. So primarily we're gonna be smoke testing them and confirming there's no cracks or leaks. In order to do so, it's pretty down and dirty. I just stuffed the tailpipes with a couple of rags. We have our smoke machine over there set up and we will be introducing the smoke right through our emissions test port. This valve should be shut. Again, we mentioned earlier that they do fail, so this should be shut, which is gonna force all the smoke down into our secondary air rail, into the exhaust header. So we're just gonna be looking to be sure that no smoke is getting out and there's no leakage. Generally, when these do fail and leak, it's coming from behind this heat shield, so it's really, you gotta check the perimeters of the heat shield. That doesn't necessarily indicate where the leak is at. That's just where the smoke is getting out of the heat shield because it's pretty well folded over and welded all the way around. So I'm gonna set you guys down so I can use both of my hands. Turn on the smoke machine here. Now, one thing, you wanna make sure that you get some good smoke coming out. And also, try not to have much airflow through your shop while you're doing this because the smoke is faint and it can be hard to see. So, there we go, we're getting some smoke. So just slide that hose on there, and then I just use a flashlight and patiently wait and watch. And hopefully we have zero smoke coming out of this manifold. Now this client has mentioned that this car has already received manifolds once, but unfortunately Ferrari never updated the design and even the new ones will fail again. There are some aftermarket headers that you can run as well, but heat management's a big issue, so you wanna make sure you have some good heat protection. Some of the aftermarket headers have a pretty ugly heat blanket on them, which I'm not a big fan of, but there's other ones, say like 2B, which have a pretty nice molded heat protection on them. I can see some whispers of smoke coming out. I wanna make sure it's coming out where my hose is going on. So, see if we can make that a little better. So far, this one's looking pretty tight. Um, a lot of times when they're leaking, it's just profusely leaking out. I did one time get very curious and I actually took all this heat shielding off of a failed header to see what the damage was like and how bad it was. And all of the damage is focused in between the two cylinders. So it would be um, two and three on this side or five and six on the other side. And the pipes basically bend right over each other with almost no room in between. And all the heat just gets concentrated right in there. And all the metal for the manifold actually just completely distorted lost shape and crumpled and fatigued and cracked wide open it was actually pretty shocking once i took it apart and saw how bad the damage was on them he's got some smoke make sure it's still not coming from the manifold that it's only coming from the hose on top and another thing i have seen that's kind of common is the exhaust studs on the head brake and the flanges will warp and they'll leak from there you can have the manifold milled flat again and replace the stud and usually back in business. So it's much better option or I guess a better failure than a cracked manifold. So we're gonna call this one good. I see no visible leaks. We'll shut this off and move everything over to the left side and give that one a good check. All right, got you guys up in here a little bit closer on this side so you can get a better look. We'll pop our cap off. We got smoke going. Let's slide that on. And just a matter of waiting. Got some smoke lingering back here. That might be from those gaskets back at the cats. It's looking pretty okay. All right, we're going to call that one good as well. So that's a big relief. This car does not need manifolds. 
Um, that's a pretty pricey repair. So one thing to always check on a 355, do it when the engine's cold, especially if you're looking to buy one, check the manifolds, have someone check it. You wanna be sure you're not gonna have to buy a set. And I gotta shut this smoke off. Woo! Now while I have all this light in here from doing that smoke test, I'm able to get you in here a little bit better and show you right at the back corner of the cylinder head, we actually do have oil dripping off and that can drip right onto the exhaust. So that is one thing to note. Again, oil leaks from the cam covers, very common on 355s. And the problem with it is the way they're sealed, there's I think about 14 different gaskets, believe it or not, that seal that up. And that's, they don't last that long. And the way they, they seal up isn't that great. And to make it worse, some people when they do timing belts on these cars, they don't pull the cam covers off and replace those seals. They just install timing belts, which means those don't get replaced as frequently and then they'll start the leak. So generally, as sad as it is, by about the three, the five year mark, those gaskets are starting to seep and leak again, which is when your timing belts are due. So really, if you're paying someone to do timing belts, ask them what they're gonna do. If they're just gonna be installing belts, or if they're gonna be pulling the cam covers, degreeing the cams and replacing those gaskets as well. It's an important factor and it really dictates a, the amount of time it takes. So if you see a much cheaper price quote on timing belts, they're probably not doing that step. Okay, so before we dive into the timing belt service, we still have a few more checks to do. And again, we just wanna verify the health of this engine. So we're gonna fire it up let it idle, build some temperature, get warm. That is because we're gonna be using a five gas analyzer. I'm gonna tap into the same ports where we just smoke test the exhaust. That's gonna allow me to read the pre-cat emissions out of each bank. I'll take a reading at idle and at an elevated RPM, 2,500, 3,000. And this just gives us a good idea of the health of the engine. And also, if you have a cracked manifold and you're sucking air in, your O2 sensors will see it. This will pick it up as well. And that could also cause check engine lights for the O2 sensors think the car is actually running too lean. It enriches the fuel, but it's actually running too rich already. So this is a good little test. It gives us a good idea on health. Now I mentioned it earlier. I'm going to take advantage. We replace the fuse for the secondary air pump. This is a cold start. I expect the air pump to turn on and function. We have two vacuum gauges, one to the supply for the vacuum reservoir and the other to the control valve of the outlet of the pump. So we're going to fire the car up. We're going to listen. We want to hear the pump run. If it doesn't run, we know we have other problems. If it is running, we want to make sure we have vacuum at both gauges so that way we know that the air is getting into the engine. Again, I know that this car has faults for the secondary air. I know that was disconnected. This is just a quick, easy test that I can do why I'm letting the car warm up to see what's going on. And it gives us a little bit more information to see how we can move forward with that part of the service and repair of the car. So let's get her fired up, give it a couple minutes to get up the temperature. We'll pull our emissions readings. Okay, she's up the temperature, so let's start sampling our exhaust gases. We'll start over here. This side is bank one, and just get our hose on, and then we'll give that a quick minute to stabilize. Come over here, and we're just gonna let this come up and stabilize. I don't expect to see any problems on this car, but it's just another check, and it, it really helps out doing this before the service and after. That way, if we do encounter a problem after this service, we have good data to refer back to from the beginning of the service and know we had a pre-existing issue or if we induced some problems while we are working on the car. You see that we're starting to come up. So I'll just give this a couple minutes, get it printed out. Then we'll elevate the RPM, get another printout, and do the same thing for bank two, which is the left side. We'll do the same thing for bank two.
So right now I'm working on getting the cover for the spark plug wires off the car because we're going to remove the spark plugs and perform a compression test. Now that's another common problem specifically to the earlier 355s where they have valve guide issues. Ferrari was using a bronze valve guide at the time and they would prematurely wear out and cause leak down and well some drivability issues that would actually be part of the cause for failed exhaust manifolds. And Ferrari actually went and updated the cars and they switched to a centered steel valve guide. But I have seen a few sets of those fail as well. So no matter the assembly number of the car, before we jump into the timing belt service, we're gonna run through and get a good compression test. And we're doing that while the engine's warm. We want it to be as accurate as possible. Now I will say that on cars that I find that need valve guides, I actually prefer to go to an aftermarket bronze magnesium valve guide. I find that those have the best performance, last the longest, and they also enable us to put in a more modern and far superior valve stem seal over the factory Ferrari one. So it's key to have a great machine shop that can get that taken care of for you and get those guides in to Ferrari specs and ultimately have a better, longer lasting repair. Now the jump back to the cold start, our secondary air pump turned on just fine. That was great, it ran through its full cycle. And also, let me get this cover off. Whew, warm. Also, we had engine vacuum on both gauges, meaning everything was working, our entire secondary air system was actually functioning, which is great, so we don't really know what the cause was, was that fuse blown because the control valve vacuum hose was off or was that hose off because the fuse was blown? Not sure. Um, we're just going to leave the system as is and advise the client. We'll run the car a few more times while we have it here. Make sure that there's no other problems with it. But really, right now it doesn't warrant any further investigation. So that is definitely nice relief. Now... That we got this blazing hot and we get the spark plugs out. You do need the special tool to pull the spark plug wires out. They're kind of buried in there and kind of tight to get in. So pop these out. You kind of got to run them in sequence also because the wires overlap each other. It's a very small channel that they have them ran into. So we'll see if we can't get this in there. There we go. And the last one come in from the front. Pop those off and we'll keep them off the hot exhaust manifold. And now we need to get the spark plugs out. And always number your spark plugs when they're coming out. In case you find something odd, it's always great to know which spark plug came out of which cylinder. So I'm setting them out in my tool cart in order that I pull them out. I'll mark them here in a second. And they all look pretty normal, which I would expect. We'll get these spark plugs out. So this one is cylinder five, and it looks good. Cylinder six, we're going from the rear forward, and it looks good. Cylinder seven, happy with all of them, perfect. All right, let's move in and get rocking on this compression test. Start up here on cylinder one. Now, one thing to note is we want to be very cognizant that we're consistent on everything we do, so that way we don't have any deviances from cylinder to cylinder. And one of those things is I have a stabilized battery charger hooked up to the battery to ensure that I have the same voltage throughout the entire compression test. You don't want to be doing this off of just the battery because by the time you get the cylinder eight from cylinder one, your voltage is going to drop, your starter speed will slow down, that will affect your results. Got our remote switch up here and we're just gonna crank it over and count the compression hits on cylinder one. We're gonna go until the gauge starts pretty much petering out and stops moving. We'll count those hits and go from there. All right, so it was 12 hits and that puts us at 200 PSI. So we will jot that number down real quick. And it looks like I lost my pin. This will work. And we'll move on and go to cylinder two. 
All right, so we're gonna go to the 12. And 200 again. Cylinder three. And that one's right at 205. And cylinder four. And that one's at 190. Get ourselves set up for bank two and document that 190. All right, so we're gonna start on cylinder five, which is the rearmost cylinder over here on bank two. Now, another thing that is very critical specifically to this car on these compression tests is your throttle. Then throttle needs to be wide open, otherwise you're gonna have just erratic numbers that are gonna steer you in the wrong direction. Now, I say it's so critical because this car has independent throttle bodies and those throttle blades are actually very close to the cylinder heads and the valves. And there's not a lot of volume in those chambers or the cylinders between the throttle blade and the valves. So when you're cranking it, it's pulling a tremendous vacuum in there. And depending on how those throttle blades are set and synchronized, if they're not synchronized perfectly and evenly across the bank, it's gonna cause a huge discrepancy in your compression readings. And if you're the open the throttles, that eliminates that variable where you're just sucking in atmospheric air with no restriction. And it gives you a much more consistent realistic reading. It's one thing that's bitten me several times on the cars with independent throttle bodies, even cars with carburetors that are really close to the head. It really changes your readings. If you have a car with a single throttle body and a much larger plenum on your intake where it's all shared, it's not as bad or not as, uh, it doesn't have as much of an effect on those, but still it's really good practice to have the throttle wide open and make sure you have no restrictions going into cylinders and make sure you're getting an accurate reading on your compression. All right, so that one's 220. That one's 220 again. 220. This side's turning out to be super consistent. We'll see what number eight has in store for us. All right, number eight, our last one. And again, 220. Okay, so let's take a minute and talk about these numbers that we ended up with. If you notice on cylinder four, we have 190 PSI. In cylinder five, we have 220 PSI. So we have a 30 PSI difference, which is a pretty big spread, but it doesn't concern me and I'll tell you why. If we look right here on our chart, that's all bank one and that's all bank two. So is what I'm actually concerned with is our grouping between banks. So bank two is actually dead nuts on, consistent all the way across the board with no change. Bank one, our spread is actually the cylinder four from cylinder three, so it's only 15 PSI. Not ideal, but not terrible. If we look at our average with these 200s, I'm not worried about that at all. The difference from bank to bank, we're not gonna worry about that just right now. So the reason why I'm not worried about that spread bank to bank all comes down to our camshaft timing. We will verify when we take this engine out and get to the timing belts before we remove them that they are timed equally bank to bank. I'm suspecting that there's probably a bit of a variance from bank one to bank two on the camshaft timing and where they're degreed in, which is changing our valve events, which is the reason why we have this spread on our compression. So it doesn't drive any alarm for right now and it's kind of drives the point of the importance of why we're checking this and also the importance why we're gonna check the cam timing before we pull the belts apart. Yep, it takes a little bit extra time, but it informs us on the condition of the car when we got it. And again, just gives us a little bit more knowledge and information so that way we can be sure that this car is sorted and ready for the customer. Okay, so there's one more thing we need to check on the car and in order to do so, we need this panel off. Now we'll also need this panel off during the service so that way we can evacuate the AC. So we're just gonna do ourselves a favor now and get it out of the way. 
So in order to get this panel off, we just have a couple screws up here for this trim ring around the air box. There is these metal trim pieces down here in the lower section with some screws that will pop off. And then we will take the weather strip seal off and that should allow this whole piece to come out and it will expose all the working bits up here. Now I have already taken the hardware off on your guys' side over there. So that way I'm not fighting before the camera's at. And get these taken out real quick. There we go. Get this panel. We need to roll our seal off, which always leaves a nice trail of white gunk on this. Always found that super irritating because we'll have to come back through and vacuum it all back out every time. Every time that happens. And we can just carefully lift our trim piece out. There we go. With the trim panel off, we have plenty of access to all the mechanical systems up here. So straight shot at our brake booster and master cylinder. We have our HVAC box here. And while we're here, take the time, guys. There's two Phillips screws here. Pull this stepper motor off. That controls our blend door right here. There's a pin that connects the stepper motor to the blend door. It's plastic, it shears frequently, and then you have no recirc door. So in order, the easiest way to check it is just to pop this off, pull the pin out, you can check the integrity, and you can replace that with an upgraded aftermarket brass pin if yours happens to break, and it's pretty easy just to slide it back in, put the screws back on. But while we're here, you know, convenient location for our AC service port, so that's gonna help us out during the service. But the real reason, I popped this off now rather than later is if you look down, let me grab you guys a light. Right down in there, that red cylinder. So this car has the Bilstein adjustable shocks. There's a great view of it right there. And you wanna pop those cylinders off and be sure that the motors and the gears on the shocks aren't broken. And also the shocks will start to seep oil up through that joint. So you can see this other one over here on the driver's side. Now, since those are so tight, I'm not gonna show you what I'm talking about up here on the front. We'll jump back to the back where they're really accessible and I have tons of space right there. So here's the rear ones as well. You wanna pull all four of these off on the car and give it a good inspection. So there's a clip down here at the bottom. You can see a little spring clip that I can actually just get off by hand back here. Makes it easy because I have the camera and pop that actuator off. So you wanna look inside and you can see where it's all splined and goes onto the shock. It will be loose in there, which is normal, but you wanna be sure that that plastic piece isn't cracked anywhere. That's a common problem on these. If it's cracked, you need a new actuator. Down on the shock is what you wanna pay attention to is this gear up on top of it. Those will crack as well. And you can replace those with just a little dowel pin or um, roll pin that goes through them. So we're making sure that that's good. And this one is good. And you can see that these just rotate and have end stops on the shock. It's all the way over on the end stop there and all the way over on the end stop there. Now, while we're here, I'll give you a quick breakdown of how these actually operate. When you put these back together, it doesn't matter where you clock or index these at. Each time you turn the key on, this motor is gonna run in both directions and it's what it's looking for is to find the end stop on this gear that way. And then it's gonna switch the other way and find that end stop. And that's how it self calibrates every time you turn the key on. So if you have a broken gear or a broken motor, it's just gonna spin continuously in one direction and never stop. And that's gonna set an error and fault in a warning light in the car. So because it does that self calibration every time you turn the key on, you don't have to worry about how you index these back on when they go back together. You can put them on however you want. It's just gonna recalibrate. You turn the key on, nothing to worry about. So this one's good. Our actuator's not broken. Our gear's not broken and there's no oil leaking up through the shock up here, it's dry. Now on the fronts, I have already checked those and there's no broken gears or actuators, although there is a little bit of seeping of oil coming up. So we will note that down and then we will jump over to this side and give it a quick check as well. Get our retaining clip off. And just slide them off and our actuator is good and our gear 
is good and our shock is dry. Excellent. Get that back on. There we go. It's a pretty thorough inspection, huh? Pretty wild. It takes some to get used to, especially new technicians when they start working on these cars to really get accustomed to that inspection because it's quite a process. Uh, I would say generally the amount of time it takes for me to work through that inspection, get our smoke test done, our compression test done, work through any faults, and to get everything compiled into an email, you're looking at a good half to three quarters of a day to get all of that done. And really you're doing all of that before you're actually doing any of the work onto the car. It's one good reason why this is considered the major service. Um, it's a lot of work that we have coming ahead of us. And there's a lot of work before we even get started and dive into those actual repairs. Now, fortunately, this car is looking like it's in really, really good shape. And it made it through some of the biggest concerns that I have on any 355 when I get them in the shop. Those big concerns is the first and foremost valve guide. So that's a big issue. It's an expensive repair. And especially when you're planning on doing timing belts, it really sidetracks the job because you end up having to pull the heads off. Our compression test showed us good results. We don't have any indication to lead us on where we think we need to do a leak down test. We're good there. As we talked about earlier, we will go back when we take the engine out and we will verify the cam timing to see if we can identify that discrepancy on the compression from bank one to bank two. The exhaust manifolds, they showed no cracks, which is great. That's a very spendy repair. And we see no signs that our catalytic converters have failed, although we'll have to do one more visual test when the engine is out of the car just to confirm that everything's good. Okay, so let's identify what we did find on the car. Really the only thing that I found a bit unusual or unconventional is the coolant leak that we have. That's a pretty substantial leak coming from the front of the engine. Space is limited and I can't see where it's at just yet. Now the first steps when I start the process of removing the engine, I'm going to be removing the rear bonnet. It's going to allow me to look straight down from the top of the engine once that is off the car and I should be able to identify it at that time. So I'm going to keep all the coolant in the car until I can identify the exact cause of that coolant leak and really see what repairs are needed for that. The other thing that was a bit unusual was the coolant hose on the gearbox oil cooler. I have not seen that before where the hoses um, have swollen up where it pushed the hose clamp off. I have seen failed hoses, but I haven't seen it eject a hose clamp like that. Um, that's a bit unusual, but again, not a huge repair and pretty easy to tackle when we're doing everything else on the car when the engine's out. Access is going to be fairly decent for that repair. Now, really, everything that I found on this car besides the coolant issues on it, were very typical of a 355, almost items that I expected to see are fine. You know, we have the cracking and torn CV boots, very common, very normal. I'm not sure if I did show you guys on camera, but there is a cracked flange for the exhaust where the muffler meets onto the catalytic converter. Those are commonly cracked because there's little ears on them and when they're tightened down too tight during service work, it'll cause a fracture and a crack on that. I did find one of those on this car, so that's one thing to note. There was a couple weird things. All of the hardware that mount the rotors to the hubs was missing. So we'll get that addressed. There's some worn grommets, some worn items. We did have the check engine light with the secondary air and the blown fuse and the vacuum line off the cutoff valve to the pump. We reconnected the vacuum line, put a fuse back in it. I only ran the car for one cold start, but it did run through its secondary air cycle. So on the tail end of the repairs, we're gonna keep an eye on that and see if we can maybe induce another problem if the pump causes the fuse to blow again. And while everything's out, we will make some checks with some other components of the car, some check valves to be sure that that system's in good operating health. So we did find a few leaks on the car. The gearbox is leaking a little bit of oil on the bottom. It looks like it's from those lower cover plates. Pretty easy repair to do there. We did have a little bit of oil dripping off of the valve covers. Again, that's because the valve cover gasket has pushed out on the ends off of the rail and causes a small drip. That is incredibly common on this generation of cars. Once I have everything apart, I'm gonna show you guys some tricks to really help minimize that and prevent that from happening. So that way the car can make it much further in between services before they'll start to leak. So now that this inspection is complete, I've already compiled all of my notes and relayed all this information back to the customer. And fortunately, we're gonna go through and address most all of these items. If you guys notice, I've been having to prop up the bonnet of the car and the front hood because the shocks are worn out. So we're gonna be replacing those. We're gonna be putting in the new wheel inserts. We're gonna be addressing the CV boots. Obviously, we're gonna be addressing the leaks, the coolant leak and the gearbox oil leaks and a few of the other smaller things that we found on the car. So definitely stay tuned for later videos because I'm gonna cover all of that work here on the channel. And most importantly, on the next video, I'm going to show you guys all of the steps it's going to take to get this engine removed from the back of this 355.
Well guys, I said it at the beginning of the video, I'm gonna say it again. I cannot stress with you guys enough on how excited I am to share everything with you on getting this car serviced and maintained. Now, I am a car guy through and through. It is absolutely a passion of mine. I have a deep respect and appreciation for Ferrari and the brand, the culture of the cars. It's something that I've always been very passionate and had a deep love for. Obviously, working for the brand for nearly 10 years just drove that even deeper. And really, if you guys have been watching some of my other videos, particularly the restoration of my 79 Centurion jet boat, you probably have a pretty good idea for how meticulous I am and my OCD and just obsession with details and making things perfect. And what a great platform we have to exercise all of those traits on during our service work on this car. As always guys, I appreciate your support. Thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to give the video a like, drop me a comment below, ask any questions that you may have on this car or what we're doing, share it with your buddy. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.